Hey, my friends, it's your old pal Jordan the Lion. Today we are making our way through Maryland on our way to Delaware, my very first time in Delaware. Look, I'm in Delaware. You know that Wayne's World joke? Yep, we're gonna go do a little bit of exploring Bob Marley's life. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. Well, shoot, I was looking for Delaware. We ended up in Pennsylvania. I'm kidding. I mean, we are, but I think that was supposed to happen. See, I knew we'd find our way here. Welcome to Delaware, endless discoveries. All right, let's go discover some Bob Marley stuff. All right, here's our sign for Wilmington. That's where we're headed. So right here, there's a park right in front of the house that Bob's mom used to live in. And it tells a little bit of the story of Bob's time here. Let me show you. You can see they even call it One Love Park. Because at the time of him coming up here, he had just recorded that song. See, it says One Love Park, originally named Tattenau Street Playground in 1907. The park is located across the street from the home at 2311 Tattenau Street. The singer-songwriter Bob Marley occupied with his mother in 1966 in order to raise funds to start his own record label in Jamaica. Marley assumed the alias Donald Marley and worked as a lab assistant at DuPont on the assembly line at nearby Chrysler plant among other jobs to honor Marley's time in Delaware. The park was renamed One Love Park in 2014, taking the name from the singer's hit with the Whalers One Love People Get Ready. Now it says it was a 1977 hit, but he had actually recorded an earlier version with like a little bit of a different beat. Now from the sign, the house is actually right over here with the green and white shutters. Let me tell you, a couple of things about this aren't very accurate. So first of all, when he lived here, he worked at the DuPont Hotel and he swept the floors with a vacuum, his wife said. And when he worked at Chrysler, he didn't work on the line. He was a forklift driver. So the true story about this place, they say that he lived at 2311, but the person at 2313 was selling this house a year ago and said that on their paperwork for the ownership of the house that Bob's mom was also on the, the ownership of that. So she may have well owned all of this right here. But here's the story, you know, Bob from the time he was young, his mother was basically impregnated when she was 16 by a man, a white man in his mid 60s that was in Jamaica that owned a construction company. And he apparently ended up kind of doing this in various parts of Jamaica. And so Bob would find out later that he had, you know, half siblings and everything. But Bob was, he was the black sheep of his neighborhood, born in Nine Mile, him being half white, half black, he was teased a lot. And so a lot of his beliefs as a young man from even the time he was like, you know, in his uh, adolescent days were not liking to feel different. So he fell in love with music and started writing music that depicted that from the earliest days that he could even play anything. His mom could make a drum out of uh, things around the house and they would, use something called a rumba box and a banjo and they would create music so he had already recorded his first recording when he was like 15 so he started putting together a music group and it was mainly doo-wop and it was like the Whalen Whalers and they were called the juveniles but they 
eventually would settle on the Whalers. So they had got a record deal and were making records already when Bob was like 17 years old, but his mom decided she wanted to move up to the United States. And so she moved here when he was 17. So he ended up moving into the back of the studio that he was recording all of his music in. The guy who owned it let him move in and live there for a couple of years. But in Jamaica, there was no real music scene, so they would take heavy advantage of the artists. And so the guys in his band, Peter Tosh and Bunny Whaler, they were making like nothing. They said they were basically making like minimum wage cutting records. So, and, and they were having like hit songs in the area. So they ended up deciding, well, Bob ended up deciding that he didn't want to do this anymore. So he said, to the band, I'm gonna go ahead and leave and I'm gonna go live with my mom up in Delaware. Now when he made that announcement, he was a practicing Rastafarian at that point and they had a lot of strict rules and he had a mentor that told him, before you leave, you have to marry Rita. Rita was his girlfriend at the time. So they actually had the wedding on February 10th and she said literally on February 11th, he packed his things and moved up here. Now, a couple of Bob's friends that lived here when he was here, he was only here for a few months. reason he ended up leaving was because he really didn't feel like he had that much freedom. He was working so much that he didn't have time to do the things that he loved. So he figured, well, I might as well go back to Jamaica and at least make music and do what I love. But while he lived here, his friends would say he was always in the basement playing guitar. He was always in there. And then his mom would tell Rita when she'd call and say, you know, what's Robert been up to her. She called him Nestor. What would that was his middle name? What's he been up to? And he's just in the basement playing guitar all the time. So that then what that sign said was true. He decided to end up leaving here and going back. But instead of working for basically what was an organized crime record label, he started his own with the band and they made their own record and then went out and started selling them on the streets and getting them in dance halls. So they weren't on the radio, but they were in every dance hall in Jamaica. And a funny thing that his friend said, you know, Bob wasn't just a pothead. Smoking marijuana was actually part of the Rastafarian religion. So that was something he had to do. He said, you know, when Bob lived here, he was growing gigantic marijuana plants right behind the house in the backyard. And he said, when I saw him, I was like, Bob, what are you doing? And he said, well, I, I, I got to have them. He said, that was, those were the days where you got into a serious trouble here in Wilmington if you, if you had drugs. Now, when I saw this for sale, it was up for sale like a year ago. It must be in major disrepair because it was going for 17500 is what they were selling it for. But let me show you something interesting. If you look just catty corner, someone dedicated their house to Bob Marley over here. Let me show you. Now I'm gonna show you as we walk over, if you look right here, look at those buildings in the background and this fence, there's a really famous photo of Bob playing soccer right here. Later on in life, this not in 66. When he was here in 66, he didn't have the dreads yet, but he would come back here later and visit. And it was him right out here kicking the soccer ball around. And you can definitely see that building in the background and the fence from this park right here. So both of these houses you can see in the background and look at what this one did. The entire theme of the house is Bob Marley. He calls it Governor Central. And someone in the neighborhood was telling me that Bob's mom also owned this house. I don't know if that's for sure or not, but you can't believe all the plaques in town. I love it. This is great. Really honoring Bob's memory here. So I mentioned that Bob used to make trips back here even after 1966 when he lived here to visit. One of those times he was visiting was in 1969 and his friend that he used to come and visit was a jewelry maker and he said that Bob was here helping him make jewelry because he was going to take it up to the Woodstock Festival the next day in New York and he kept trying to persuade Bob come on come with me you got to see this and see what this is all about and uh, and he said Bob just always kept such a low profile he didn't want to go and be a part of it or anything. 
Now I want to head over to Market Street because that's where a lot of the shops they used to shop at were. And apparently there's a mural to Bob Marley over there. Bad news, it looks like the mural is gone now. I did not see it. There's one other thing I want to see while we're here in Wilmington. About a cup of coffee. So I'm going to post a photo of what Bob looked like when he got married, the wedding day photo, so you'll see what he looked like when he moved here in 1966. He would have been 21 years old, pretending to be Donald Marley. When I mentioned that he went back to Jamaica and sold his own records, he needed to borrow money, wanted to get some money for a car to do that, so he went to his dad's construction company and when he walked in, they said you could have heard a pin drop because he looked exactly like his dad. And when he asked for money, they said he doesn't have any kids. Apparently, Bob only ever saw him a handful of times in his whole life. Looks like this is what we were looking for right up here. So here we have a giant monument to President William McKinley. Now what this is all about, is you'll see up here that it says, President, Governor, Member of Congress, Major Captain, Lieutenant, Sergeant. And there's a picture of him. And then if you take this in, it looks like a soldier handing out drinks. But what it really is, take this in, what it really is is in 1862, the bloodiest day of the Civil War, an obscure Union commissary soldier made an impression by delivering coffee under fire to the exhausted men on the front lines. That soldier turned out to be future President William McKinley, and the tale of this coffee break, bravery, became his political asset. He told it and retold it for every election. No question, definitely an act of bravery, but you almost wonder... That's why he did it. Now this building over here was the original First Presbyterian Church here in Wilmington, but it actually, this section is called Brandywine. And it says that during the Battle of Brandywine, the British ended up using this as a hospital and obviously if it was a British hospital, it would have been during the American Revolution. I'm gonna go take a look at the river over here. There's some really cool view spots over here. This is actually right across from the McKinley cup of coffee. Well, my friends, we're gonna call it a day. Hope you enjoyed our jaunt back into Bob Marley history. I love his music so much. One of those people that really, really meant what he sang about. He was true blue, always trying to unify people. It was cool to see where he lived before his career really took off. Thank you all for watching. Have a great night and goodbye. <laughs>